Greetings, attendees, and welcome. If you could please type in your name, where you're tuning in from, in the comments box, that would be much appreciated. Welcome to IFMA's newest installment on the Operations and Maintenance Benchmark Report. This one focuses on North America. The final report will be available for purchase in the IFMA bookstore on September the 22nd. Participants who participated in the study will receive a link to the free copy by the 22nd. This link will allow you to view the report on a web browser. Today's presenter is Je Dr. Jake Smithwick, Associate Professor, Graduate Program Director at Construction and Facilities Engineering at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Over to you, Jake. All right, thank you so much, Nick, and thank you all for being here today. I'm excited to uh, present today's topic and go through the latest benchmark report. I would just say for the record here that um, today's topic uh, the North American Benchmark Report is probably one of the IFMA's most widely used, widely requested products, and uh, we're excited to present the latest results of that. I see we have some folks in the chat box here. So we have Brad from Toronto, Brent from Vancouver, and I'm sure we have lots of other folks. So make sure you introduce yourselves and uh, be glad to uh, chat with you all here today. So again, thank you so much for being here today. And with that said, we'll go ahead and dive in. So today's agenda, we'll go through the benchmarking process overview and just kind of get set a baseline for what this means and what I when I talk about benchmarking and what that entails. Go through some of the facility demographics in terms of what our data set looks like. And then we'll dive into the, the meat and potatoes, as it were, of the janitorial maintenance and utility cost. And at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A as well. So be sure, again, I encourage you all, type in your questions, add your comments here and uh, we'll go ahead and address that. One comment I do wanna make off the bat here is that yes, this recording, uh, this webinar is being recorded. It'll be posted live on LinkedIn and YouTube and a variety of other platforms. So be sure to look out for that after today's webinar. So um, why benchmarking? Why we're actually working on this? Um, when you think about benchmarking, the goal of this is to have information that allows you to make decisions, decisions based on the data that's collected, right? But I find that a lot of the time that when folks uh, ask for benchmarking data, it's, okay, I like the data, it seems interesting, but we don't do anything with it. So the, the value in benchmarking is being able to take that data and do something with it, right? Um, what this does, it helps us increase the usefulness of, of this data for everyone, and then also make sure that we can actually do something and, and go to that next step once we have that data in place here. Um, one of the key things um, that we, we we, when we focus on this report is we use the data or use experts from uh, North America to help guide and, and set up the overall research program. So that's just a little bit of background um, about how we got this um, set up here. Okay, um, some of the, a little bit of background about our research group. Uh, we're, we're called Simplar. We're um, a, a group of faculty and researchers from different uh, other other universities, um, we do integrate with owners and different groups to help them become more efficient about delivering those services that they they might have or uh, might have here. Our goal is to help them become uh, clients of choice or vendors of choices, and really that's a lot of where our research is focused on is how to become better owners or buyers of services. Okay, so let's dive into um, the facility description and take a look at this here. Now, a brief history lesson is uh, how did this report get started? Well, in 2017, uh, we we had the report that was published, the Operations and Maintenance Benchmark Report, which is not the first version of the report, but it's really the first in a new line of work, I would say, that IFMA has taken on to deliver products that are focused on benchmarking and value to the practitioner. So this this particular report, the newest reversion, is a update of that 2017 report. 2018, we followed on with a qualitative report of various practices in FM. That's also been a very popular report. 2020, uh, we had our space planning benchmark report. Now, a quick sorry, uh, sto story about this is that this benchmark report that provides space planning details is probably the only report available that provides benchmarks as they were right before the COVID hit. So we collected data, we finished collecting data for this report in, I think it was about December of 2019. January 2020. So it's like right before everything started happening. So the data is uh, provides a really good perspective of how things used to be from a space planning st uh, standpoint. So if you're looking for that, be sure to check that out. It's uh, 
you know, hopefully pretty useful. And then finally, uh, last year we published the Global Salary and Compensation Report that looks at how much do facility practitioners make, uh, what, uh, how, what, how much, what do they earn, what benefits are offered, and the whole slew of other data that's tied to compensation and other portfolios tied to the facilities profession. So the reason why I give this brief history is that these reports in some form or fashion have guided the development of the newest report that we're going to be talking about today here. So one thing that IFMA does is a continuous, uh, continuous improvement approach, meaning that we always build on, on previous reports to helpfully provide a better product at the end of the day here. So how do we compile this report? Uh, we reviewed questions from the previous report as a, as a starting point. We had a group of subject matter experts that provided pilot testing and input as to how the report should be structured. It was sent to both IFMA and non-IFMA members. There wasn't any requirements to be a member of IFMA or otherwise. And in total, we had about 1,900 valid survey responses received for this. So a very robust report, a lot of detail uh, covering a wide variety of areas uh, tied to the operations and maintenance of the report. Uh, most of the cost data here is presented in USD, uh, US dollars. Um, when they are Canada specific uh, values, we do present those in Canadian dollars, but in general, most of these are pre presented in terms of US dollars here. We're gonna briefly talk about what our sample looks like in terms of uh, the respondents. Again, this is not everything. This is just a, a quick snapshot of what our, our profiles look like. In the industry sector, we do have our respondents that are from primarily three different categories. That's how we classify buildings. We have institutional buildings. So these are like government buildings, educational facilities. Um, there's some limited military and federal government facilities. Uh, there are manufacturing buildings. So things that produce something is, is classified as manufacturing. So aircraft, building, computers, whatnot. And the third one not shown on this screen is services. So things that uh, for somebody comes in and provides a service to a consumer, so restaurants, uh, other you know, commercial businesses, those are classified under services. So this is the, in the report, most of the, the various metrics I show here, we provide data on the number of respondents. So this is how many people provided data to us. And then we also provide data about how many buildings this data is based on here. So in total, we had about just under uh, 40,000 buildings. Uh, this one says 31,000. There's different views of the data, but we have uh, basically tens of thousands of buildings that our data set is built on here. Um, in terms of the types of buildings or how those are set up, you can see that this yellow uh, piece of the pie is a single building. Uh, dark blue are multiple buildings in multiple locations. So think of a portfolio of buildings. Uh, light blue is single buildings, uh, excuse me, multiple buildings in one location, and this red sliver are spaces within a building. So that, that's how we classify data. Uh, we also, throughout the report, uh, provide regional data. You can see the breakdowns here, about 5% of respondents were from Canada and then other geographic regions uh, throughout the United States. So this provides a breakdown of where our distributions are coming from. Our top categories are from the Mid-Atlantic, so DC, Maryland, uh, North Carolina, uh, southeast is at 10%, so Atlanta, uh, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Tennessee. And then we also have uh, South Central U.S., so Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and, and Texas, primarily where, where a lot of our respondents are, are coming from. Now, one thing I want to mention here is that as I go through and present these various demographic factors, the reason why I do that is because throughout the report, that's how data is presented. So, for example, if you're interested in janitorial costs, we will present that in terms of location, in terms of size of the building, in terms of the, look, um, the the use of the building, the industry sector, and also the age of the building. So that that's why I present this here, is that we present these demographic factors by different parts of uh, what we're looking at with that. In terms of uh, facility ages, uh, this breaks it down. So for example, um, this, this is less than five years. This is five to 10 years, 11 to 15 years, and so forth. Dark blue are services type buildings, red is manufacturing, and light blue is institutional. So again, this provides a sample of where our data is coming from to help provide some context about what this is looking like. Now, it's interesting, over the last 12 to 18 months, IFMA has embarked on a global study of benchmarking to benchmark various uh, regions throughout the world. So we currently have reports available for Asia broadly, um, India, 
we have some uh, benchmark reports also from Europe. We're currently finalizing a report for the Middle East, and we're also working on additional reports uh, in other geographic regions as well. Africa is coming on board here soon. So the reason I bring this up here is that eventually in the next uh, you know, three to five, five months, the IFMA is going to have global benchmarks about facility operations for most of the major regions throughout the world here. And it's interesting, as I've been looking at this data, there's a lot of differences in terms of the types of buildings we survey, but also the performance of those buildings. So one major difference that we're seeing here, at least in terms of the respondents, that North American facilities tend to be much older in terms of the sample size compared to like Asia, for example. When we published our age report, I'd say about 40% of the respondents had buildings that were less than 15 years old. Whereas in North America, most of these are above 30, you know, a, a large portion of these institutional buildings are about 50 years old. So the reason why that's relevant to us is because as you think about how do I understand the data that we're seeing, you need to understand that North American facilities tend to be much older compared to like buildings in Asia. And that'll change how we, how we look at different things. We also provide data about um, how the, the space is managed, uh, whether it's leases uh, as a tenant, own and occupy, own and lease to others or own but partially lease. And we break that up by different types of facilities as well. So for example, a single building that's just by itself, 95% of respondents own and occupy that building. 3% of them will uh, lease it as a tenant. So if for some reason that is of interest to you or, or value to you, you have data about that as, as well here. Now, this is getting into some major changes since the last report from uh, five years ago. We, we calculated the space allocations per occupant. And what you see here is that throughout the report, we have these percentile charts. So the 99th percentile, what that means is imagine they have a big set of data and you pull out the top 1%. Or in other words, you look at or ignore the other 99%. That provides the, this average data point that we're, we're talking about. The bottom 1% is, imagine again, you have sorted data, and you look at just the bottom 1%, the, the very lowest part of that, and that provides data on that here. On average, we found that the average square feet per occupant is about 2,000 square feet, uh, gross square feet per occupant. This has nearly doubled uh, since the previous report. Now, the reason why that is, in my opinion, is that when we collected the survey, we asked respondents to provide us about right before COVID hit. So that because we weren't sure at the time how COVID was affecting our samples, we decided let's just look at data before the building hit. My suspicion is that there's still COVID impacts that are within this data set. Now, I'm gonna show you a little bit later on how we, we dealt with that here, but um, I think there are some implications of, of our data here because if there's no one in the building, it's not like our buildings are shrinking because of COVID. So therefore the average space allocations are going up uh, per occupant. I also want to let you know that IFMA is uh, refreshing its space allocation benchmark report. Uh, we've got a group of people that we're finalizing to help us guide on that. And that'll be coming out here soon. And I think we're gonna see some major changes in terms of how space is allocated. So more to be more to come on this uh, story here, but uh, just initially we're seeing some major shifts in terms of how we allocate space, those policies are. And so uh, be sure to keep an eye on that. One new section of the report was um, obviously not around in 2017, but the impacts from COVID-19. And so when this report, this is one of the first sections of the new report is we're looking at how has COVID affected facility operations, both from a uh, practice the standpoint, things that we're doing standpoint, but also from the cost impacts as well. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about uh, the different things that we've seen uh, with this. Now, folks, I do want to remind you that if you have comments or questions or things that don't make sense, please, please make sure you add those to LinkedIn or to whatever platform you're watching on, because I will see those, we'll address those, and we'll make sure we, we get your questions answered here. So one of the first things we asked respondents was, how are you managing, uh, managing the social distancing requirements or health requirements in comparison to what the government is telling you to do? So the red factors here look at, we exclusively followed the CDC or the Canadian equivalent uh, PHAC uh, cleaning guidelines. So the government provided guidelines about here's how you're supposed to clean your facilities. So for example, in institution facilities, 56 respondents only did what the government had, had said that they should do. 44% of them went above and beyond 
what the government has asked them to do. Manufacturing, 35% did what the government did, but 65% did more than what was asked, and then finally for services. We also break these factors down by facility use, the total number of building occupants before COVID, and then the building size as well. So if you have an interest in understanding how government regulations have affected how we manage our buildings, this report provides some, frankly, I think interesting insights as to how different types of facilities have responded to that. Another thing we asked about too here, and I think this is also interesting, is the work from home trims for FM staff. So we asked, based on your total facility staff here, what percentage of them are working from home as a result of COVID-19? And not surprisingly, um, we had two extremes. We had a small number of people that are working from home, and then everybody else was uh, obviously not working at home because we have to run our facilities, and that's what we kind of saw here. So for institutional uh, facilities, one to 10% uh, facility staff were working from home. So 22% of the respondents said that this number of people were working from home, whereas 37% of our respondents said basically everybody is on site. So this is a difference, of course, compared to other job functions where you can work from home and you can still you know, meet your business objectives. As facility professionals, of course, we can't do that. We typically need to be on site to provide a lot of the services that we're seeing here. Now, I wanna make sure that you all understand that as I present this data, I, I'm presented by industry sector here, you know, institutional manufacturing and services. We also break it down by building size, uh, the use of the building, and some other demographic factors as well. We also provided data where we asked respondents about how has COVID affect work from home into the future for all building occupants, not just FM staff. So we're looking at all occupants. What we found here is we're not exactly sure. 11% uh, of the respondents said that in the future, all our employees will work remotely. 74% of the respondents said that some employees can work remotely, and 15% said that everybody has to come back on site uh, if they were previously remote, right? So there's, I think the work from home uh, practice is going to continue in some form or fashion. Again, we break this down by different sectors and different building types, and you can see the full report that provides uh, more detail on that. We also asked respondents, now this one here, I. Frankly, I'm not sure how to interpret this, but this is what the data has says. There's other reports out there that are also kind of the same. But we asked respondents, uh, facility managers, do you expect the size of your building footprint to change in the future, right? Because of COVID-19. 2% said that they're increasing their building footprint because of COVID-19. 50% almost said there's no change to the building footprint. 50% said, no, we're not changing the size of our building's footprint. 17% said they're reducing the, the, the footprint. 22% are changing it, either up or down, but not because of COVID. And another 12% aren't really sure what's going to happen. Now, here's why this is surprising to me. If we expect that three quarters of our, our respondents expect that some level of employees are going to be working from home indefinitely into the future, then how is it that our building footprints aren't going to be changing? So, I, I don't really know, frankly, to, to be honest with you all, what this, how to interpret this. Um, it's just something to think about. And if as uh, future reports, we'll look at this in more detail here. But um, I, I think that the takeaway from this is that there are changes coming that we need to start considering here. If we know we have a large contingent of our workforce that's going to be working from home, I think in some regards that might decrease the demand for uh, physical facility phase. If you have hoteling or you have people that come in out certain days of the week here, that can obviously change our, our occupancy factors and other usage factors of our, our space as well. So more to come on that. Again, like I mentioned here, we do break this down by facility use, the number of building occupants and building size as well with this. So more to come on this here. Um, you know, we do have a couple of questions that come here. Um, FMs are always on site, but no work from home from us. <laughs> <laughs> sort of this, that's true, right? We, we did talk about FMs are always on site. Uh, the other question that came out is how many of uh, FMs were the COVID uh, manager coordinator or in charge of your facility? And that's a really good question. Um, we, we didn't ask that question specifically, but based on the types of uh, comments that we saw here that facility managers by and large were responsible for more rolling out the work from home policies, 
from setting up uh, sanitation and hygiene practices, from enabling social distancing. And so uh, based on the comments that I've seen, and we have like detailed recommendations in the report, there's a huge responsibility placed on FMs to deal with COVID-19. So certainly this excellent question, we don't have data on that, but based on what I've seen, FMs, many of them were required to deal and respond with COVID-19 and provide that, that leadership here. So really good question, thank you. Again, others, make sure you chat in there and we'll be sure to address this as we go forward. Now, another part of this COVID section, and I've not seen this uh, published elsewhere here, so this is, I think, uh, pretty exciting. We calculated uh, the, the cost of social distancing by lots of different criteria. So we looked at wayfinding, barriers, uh, like physical barriers, uh, rearranging offices, security, the cost of PPE for occupants, teleworking, others, and the total cost uh, we, uh, for all these things. We broke this down by injury sector, by facility use, by the number of building occupants, and by the size of the building. And we provide some details here about what these costs have looked like. So this is pretty interesting that if you're looking to evaluate what the cost uh, impacts have been, or how to maybe forecast into the future for other flare-ups or other things that might come or might be resolved, uh, might be impacted by social distancing. This report provides a lot of detail about what that might entail uh, because of that. We also provide hygiene and sanitation cost of COVID-19. So hand sanitizer, isolation, increased you know, sink run times, uh, paper towels, uh, other types of cost. And we break this down by the, the cost per square foot, and also the cost by occupant. So again, we had actually a really good sample size as several hundred people provided data about this. And so I feel quite confident that the data that's presented here is pretty accurate. So again, if you're looking to have that, that baseline or that benchmark about what the true cost of COVID has been, uh, this report uh, provides a lot of detail about that. Again, if you have questions or comments, uh, be sure to drop those into the comment box and we will see those and we'll try to address those uh, throughout the presentation. So that's the impacts um, from uh, COVID-19. Let's kind of shift gears now, and we'll talk about some other things as well. One of the, the standard parts of the report is sustainable uh, operations of maintenance. So we do provide some details about practices and different things that have been done uh, in this sector here. We look at green certification. So when we talk about green certification, what that means is, have you taken on um, like a, a LEED certification, so you know, LEED gold or platinum or silver, whatever you might have. Um, that's an example of a green building. Um, and and there's, there's other programs available here too. So we provide breakdowns by industry type, so services, uh, manufacturing, and institutional. And the percentage of buildings or respondents that reported that they have no green elements, they have plans for certification in the future, but not they're not certified right now. They do have green elements, but no certification. And then one or more of their buildings are certified. Now, as we've looked at this data here, over time, um, things have kind of changed um, over the years. That I would say that the, the actual certification of buildings has kind of trended downward. That the number of buildings that are actually getting green certified for whatever program are in general uh, decreasing over time. So if I track this uh, on a regular basis, just to see what those trends are, but um, I, I think there's more to come with that. And, and frankly, um, other types of programs I think might become more prevalent here. And you'll see what I mean um, in, a memo, in a moment. We also track uh, recycling programs. Um, so what percentage of respondents recycle cardboard, paper, batteries, and so forth. And so the, uh, the report provides some details about that. As I mentioned earlier, uh, earlier that IFMA is taking on a global perspective about these, uh, these benchmarks. So when you look at uh, recycling programs like in North America compared to, um, I'm thinking of like Asia, for example, uh, the use of recycling programs is much lower in Asia and India and some other uh, geographic regions as well. In North America, for at least for the categories I have listed, it, it tends to be much higher. Uh, from that standpoint. So it's something that we're tracking. It's something that we need to raise awareness of to, to see the value in doing these things here. And again, we'll be tracking this into the future to see how things have changed here. Now, I just mentioned that there are changes in terms of how we manage our energy. And I think this report, um, frankly, is, is quite exciting. 
and provide some very new insights that previously we've not seen before. Across the board, we ask respondents, are you using these a variety, it's about 30 different practices. Of these 30 different practices, are you using them in your facility? What we found in the newest report here is that by and large, almost every single practice has increased by about 10 to 15%. So the use of various energy management practices is increasing across the board, and some of these are going up significantly. One of the biggest areas that we saw changes in is in alternative energy sources. So you can see here that this is uh, 2021, and this is 2017. So electric vehicle, 50% of respondents said they have, they have that. 44% had installed uh, solar systems for electric use. In 2017, we're at 8%. Uh, alternative energy or renewable energy, 33%, 2017, 5%. So the reason why this brings this up here is that the use of alternative energy sources, in spite of everything that's going on, is continued to not just increase, but like dramatically increase. So I think as the as a prudent facility manager into the future, these technologies are going to be more commonly used and, and used to a scale here that we're really not used to seeing here. I mean, in my view, uh, government regulations tied to like decarbonization or net zero or near net zero buildings are going to be policies into the future. And why this affects us as a facility professional is that we're going to have to retrofit our buildings and respond to these different regulations and rules that are coming down uh, and, uh, and down the line into the future. So something to be aware of. We're tracking this, and it's really quite fascinating to see how things are changing uh, over time here. Okay. So we're going to shift gears now into uh, kind of meat and potatoes of uh, what a lot of FMs like to see data on. And again, I'm just providing a kind of a, a sampling of the different types of data that is in our report. You can read the full report that provides a lot more detail than I'm going to talk about here for janitorial maintenance and utility costs. So for um, janitorial costs, that's what this is presenting. I provide the, the average cost. So this is the mean cost, $1.96 per square foot. In 2017, it was at $2.17 per square foot. So the, the cost here has actually dropped a little bit. Um, of course, across 1,000 square feet, you know, a, a 15 cent per square foot drop can be significant. Um, but costs have dropped a little bit on the janitorial side of things. Now, we don't discuss why that is. That's beyond the, the scope of the report. But some perspectives on this, I think they're there might be two things that, that are driving this, this these cost, sort of, uh, cost changes. One is that I mentioned that we asked respondents to provide us data before COVID started. However, it's possible that we are seeing cost impacts in our, in our, our benchmark here because of COVID-19. We told people not to do it, but that's one potential explanation. If there's less things to clean, less you know, services to provide the services for, a uh, building to provide that for, then cost will naturally go down here. Um, another explanation is that the labor market uh, prior to COVID, if th not not COVID, but think be, be before COVID, the, the labor market was pretty strong. There's a lot of demand, and when there's a lot of demand or excuse me, supply, uh, cost for certain things can also go down here. So we track this on a regular basis. We'll see what the future holds here, um, but this is kind of the data that we're seeing here as well. We do break up the cost for janitorial by facility use, by industry, by operating schedule, location, and other factors. So if you're looking to kind of get a breakdown of what this entails, uh, be sure to check out the website. All right, excuse me, check out the report. We also break down costs by uh, green certification for janitorial and the, and the cost of that. We break it down by, um, by in-house for subcontracted operating days per week, cleaning hours, or recycling programs. So we have lots of details about that. Now, knowing that COVID has had an impact on everything we do, the report also includes specific details about the actual percentage impact from COVID-19 on janitorial. So we do provide some breakdown about uh, this. These are the cost impacts. So 30% or more cost increase, 4% of the respondents said they, they were at this level. 20 to 29% increase in cost, 10%, and so forth. So if you're looking to understand what COVID has done to janitorial cost, the report provides a lot of detail about that as well. The report also provides details about typical staffing allocations for janitorial 
And um, so you can look at the number of FTEs allocated for janitors, the number of uh, janitorial supervisors, and the number of project cleaners, special cleaning, and other floor crews that might be required. So we have a whole breakdown of staffing portfolios based on facility size that is also available in the report. I want to take a brief drink of water here. So if you do have questions, now's a good time for you to uh, add those into the chat box here and uh, make sure you let us know. All right. Okay, so let's move on here. Um, we also provide details about maintenance cost. So inside the report, we provide uh, maintenance costs, again, cost per square foot, dollars per square foot. For the external building, which is things like uh, the, the skin of the building or the facade, the roofing systems and other things that are outside of the building. We provide maintenance costs for the interior systems. So think of flooring, uh, lighting, ceiling tiles, things like that. We'll also provide cost details for roads and grounds, utility or central systems, process treatment, and then we provide the total overall cost across these factors. Just like everything else in the report, we break that down by facility use, by sector, size, location, age of the building. So there's a lot of different demographic factors that you can look at uh, for this as well. Now, I do see a question that's come in here. Are there any specific numbers for electric a static spray, and additional detailed disinfection for various uh, verticals. Uh, to a certain degree, Paul, uh, we do cover that in the COVID section of the report about um, the cost of responding to like sanitation practices. Uh, that specifically is embedded in some of the costs. You'll kind of see that listed out. So to answer your question, um, that is provided in the report. We do provide some high level costs per square foot to deal with that. And there's also a variety of different practices that are described in the report that can provide insights uh, on that as well. If that doesn't answer your question, Paul, be sure to clarify or send me an email at the end and that will provide a little bit more detail on that. Great question, thank you so much. So back to our maintenance cost. Um, the other thing we do here as well, just like for janitorial, we look at the cost impact of COVID on maintenance. And so you can see here that, uh, again, just like before 30 to more percent cost impacts, uh, 20 to 29% and so forth and the number of respondents that reported these various uh, cost level impacts as well. Now, one of the most interesting things, um, right, kind of intriguing, I, I guess not interesting, but intriguing, is that we asked respondents, how do you track your maintenance program? What tools or software do you use to you know, track when you had to perform various you know, preventative maintenance functions? Since 2017, compared to 2021, there has been very little movement, I would say overall, on the types of software that are used. So for example, in 2017, uh, we had 14% of the respondents that used the CAFM to track their maintenance programs. In 2021, we're at 10%. Before, for like spreadsheets, uh, spreadsheets and Excel, 2017, we're at 37%. Uh, the most recent report, we're at 30%. So there's not been a whole lot of movement to use technology and software. Uh, I think that's certainly an opportunity. Um, that, that'll be available in the future, but these are things to be future. Um, we had another question come in, is that, is this report available? It is currently in the final steps of being finalized. It'll be available on September 22nd for purchase on the IFMA's bookstore, and uh, links will be sent out, advertisements will be sent out once that is actually available. And there's a link there, ifma.org slash marketplace slash IFMA bookstore, that will provide a detail of that. So Elaine, great question. It's coming, so be sure to uh, mark your calendars and that'll be available here in a couple of weeks. Uh, finally, the third major part of the report are tied to utility costs. So we provide the average cost for a gross square foot for electricity, fuel oil, natural gas, steam, water, and sewer, and the total utility cost. And we also break this down by industry sector, green certification, and um, use of central plants and, and countries. Um, we had another question coming here is why is software uh, not being used? Uh, so that's actually getting back to this chart here. That, that's the question that comes up here is why is it not more used more often? Um, that, that's a really interesting question. If I were to speculate, I think there's, there's two reasons. I think the first reason is that if we have a robust Excel file that tracks everything that we need to do and we're used to using that, as a facility professional, it's hard to make a change to go away from what's worked for us for you know, 10, 15 years, right? The change is hard, I think is, is the first answer. 
I think the second answer too is that if you look at the data, and this is not specific, specific to FM, but if you look at the data overall, um, IT projects and rollouts have been notoriously difficult. There's a lot of change, there's a lot of challenges with that. And frankly, people I think are kind of nervous and I think rightfully so to be concerned about how do we bring on a new system that you know, maybe has had challenges in the past year. Now, the flip side to this is that having an effective IT software solution that will track your assets more effectively is extremely beneficial if it's done correctly. And so I think that's something to look at, but it has to be done well. And there's huge advantages, frankly, that can be get if you, you know, look at these, these software technologies. So I don't know for sure, Paul, this is an excellent question. Why is it used more often? Uh, I think it's something to keep an eye on, but it's just historically, and the trend continues, there has been a lot of shift to adopt some of these other, you know, ERP level type of uh, technologies here. Great question. Uh, the report also provides details about energy use index. So we provide um, electricity kilowatt hours per square foot, therms per square foot, uh, water usage by gallons, and uh, there's other reasons for that as well. So you can see that, and um, uh, we also provide some details about how people have changed their energy consumption. 42% um, of the respondents said that they had decreased uh, consumption since the previous year. Uh, the, the biggest reason why they said that is because intentional energy management and conservation practices is the biggest reason. I think COVID uh, certainly has had, a, had an impact on that as well, but this is what the board is, is telling us. Okay, um, kind of a, a closing part of the report um, looks at the total cost of operations. So we sum together the janitorial, the maintenance, and the utility cost. We add that together and we present um, the total operational cost of our facilities. And that's what this presents to us. And we again, we break this down by facility use, by industry, operating schedule, setting age, and other demographic factors as well. Now, uh, kind of the closing part of more of our presentation is that we do uh, provide some details about maintenance staffing. I would say this is probably, yes, I think this is the most common question we get, is how many people do I need to hire for a given fun a job function? So how many carpenters, how many like plumbers, whatever, how many people do, you need, do I need to hire for my particular facility here, right? So when you think about this and we look at the data, we provide staffing profiles by different types of uh, perspectives on this, right? So we look at, like, I'm just showing the electricians table here. So we have the number of electricians. We break this down by the size of the facility, the number of respondents, so the number of data points we have to calculate the averages. We have the number of full-time equivalents, so the number of FTEs. So one FTE is somebody that is defined as working 40 hours per week. So for uh, less than 50,000 square feet buildings, we have an average of just under one full-time equivalent. Whereas a building that's 250,000 to 500,000 square feet, we're looking at about two and a half full-time equivalents. Now, this next column here is the total square feet managed per occupant. This is a new uh, metric that is in this year's report. As we looked at how many square feet are these people responsible or over or responsible for, and uh, this can be beneficial as well. Of these FTEs, what percentage of them are in-house versus contracted out? We look at the number of shifts per day, and then we look at the number of days uh, per week. So number of shifts per day, so about one or just under one at three days a week for very small facilities. Uh, as you get to the larger facilities, we typically have just uh, about two shifts per day at five days per week. So again, there's a lot of details that we provide for this. Uh, this is the full report, uh, excuse me, the full table for electricians. We also provide the same report, um, plumbers, controls, and low voltage, HVHC, carpenters, stationary engineers, generalists, painters, uh, maintenance administration, admin staff, help desk, and we provide a whole slew of other detailed uh, types of information here about what this um, entails. Um, one of the questions that has come through is, do we provide this uh, same, report, uh, same report for APAC? So I assume that's for Asia Pacific. The answer is yes. Uh, this similar type of report is available for uh, Asia Pacific. And uh, I don't know if uh, Ashley or Nick can drop them in the chat box, but we do have a similar report available for Asia Pacific. So you can get staffing details, cost benchmarks, and that is also available as well. Now, uh, one of the most interesting questions I've seen here 
is when people ask us about how many people do I need to have or I do need to hire, assumes uh, there's a couple of major assumptions with this as well, right? When we ask ourselves, how many people do we need to hire, right? It assumes that everybody has the same level of capability. That if I hire you know, one person to do this job, that's the same as hiring another person. But as you know here, there's different levels of capability that are provided to us here. So I want to spend the last part of my presentation that focuses on what do we need to look at with regard to the staffing standpoint and um, and and different things that are related to that. So I want, I want to talk about staffing here in a moment here. Uh, one other quick thing I want to go back for a minute here about the APAC report. The one thing that the APAC report does not have because we didn't have that available at the time was impacts from COVID-19. So like that detailed janitorial, or excuse me, the sanitation and hygiene costs, those not are provided in the age report. But if you're looking for details about staffing, janitorial, uh, maintenance cost, um, different practices, that's all provided for the Asia Pacific report, and that's included as well. Okay, let's think about here about why the staffing issue is something that we need to think about and uh, different things here um, you know, for what we need to think about with this as well. This data here is focused on, this is just the United States, and presents a really interesting chart. And I think to have this discussion a little bit more effectively here about the, um, the staffing standpoint is to look back in time in history to understand what's happened here for a minute. This first chart here shows the number of people that work in construction and facilities management in 2007. 2007, the reason why this year is important to us is that in 2008, we might remember was a great recession. So a bunch of people left the industry and uh, that's that's the reason why we look at that. So this is right before our most recent recession barring the COVID impact, right? So this is the number of people and their ages. So if you look at like 39, age 39, there's, I don't know, maybe about 20% of the population that worked in construction was age 39. So these are older people, these are younger people, and you can see our nice bell curve here that we look at. This chart, shows 2014. And if you look at this carefully here, there is a shift. If you look at how these uh, these charts looking at, is that in 2014, the age has shifted up almost across the board, right? The average age in construction and facility management has increased over time. And in fact, if you look at this difference right here, this 51 to 39 age group, the reason why this is so interesting that if you take out 2007 and look how things have changed overnight, guess what happens? Watch this, everybody. You take out that, this group has left. This age demographic has left the workforce. The reason why this is so significant is that this age demographic is primarily provides a lot of the skills and the expertise and the capabilities to do the things that we need to get done in construction and facility management. And we saw that because of the last recession, a lot of people um, have uh, have left the workforce. And so when you think about that, um, it's a really interesting thing to think about. There's another data that we looked at as well. We asked facility managers just recently is how many people uh, are, how many years until they retire in the workforce? Let me leave this chart up on the, on the table here and take a look at this. Everybody see this? In 2010, we asked respondents, um, how many years until you retire? 13% said it's less than five years until they retire. Five to 10 years are at 36% and so forth. So what this tells us in 2010, half of the respondents, half of facility managers <laughs> said they were planning on retiring by 2020. I mean, this is incredible, right? If you think about it, that if half your workforce is plan on retiring within five to 10 years, this is not something that we can fix like overnight. This is a very significant problem. Now in 2021, we asked the same surveys, how many years until we retire? And you can see here that has dropped a little bit, that there are a lot of you know younger people coming into the facilities workforce. And so the, the problem has certainly been addressed to a certain degree here, right? So it's interesting when we think about how do we transition to our next workforce and how do we kind of you know, think about this um, for going into the future here? So we kind of have a couple of questions coming up. Is One of the questions is, how do you convince uh, people on top, like a finance director or whoever, um, that the institution said that maintenance manpower um, 
you know, should be required, right? So I think when we think about these questions here and how we address this, the answer is that we have to show the value proposition that us as facility managers bring to the table, that the people we're hiring have the skills and the expertise to do what we need to do in terms of responding to this year, right? So this is interesting. 2010, a lot of people were planning on retiring. 2021, just a year and a half ago, it's not quite as significant, right? So when we think about how do we transition, how do we find our workforce, we did some other studies about what does that succession plan look like, right? Here's what we found here. Now, folks, this is, um, <laughs> I think this is shocking and it's really interesting. We looked at construction and facilities, um, these are contractors, and we asked them, how, how long does it take to plan a succession? Here's what we found. Nine years on average to have a successful succession, meaning you have an executive or somebody that's in the organization that transitions to somebody else. Two years of those nine are for planning and finding somebody. Three years was planning that successor. And then the last four years of actually doing that transition. Here's another number one reason is that, that this happens is that due to health issues or unexpected reasons because somebody gets sick or they die and therefore we have to transition. That's the number one reason why succession happens because we don't expect it and people move on, right? That's really concerning here because what that tells us is that our ability to effectively plan for and respond to these issues is limited. If things happen unexpectedly and very quickly, our ability to respond to that is, is, is our hands are tied, right? So when you think about succession planning and planning for the future, this is something that cannot happen overnight when you think about this. So one thing that I have to think about this as well here is that as you think about succession planning, hopefully one of the main takeaways is how do you make that business case for the future? And especially how do you make the case to the C-suite that this is something we need to think about? In fact, this is an upcoming report that we need to think about for facility managers. Uh, we're actually coming up with a, a new report that's gonna be rolled out here in the coming months is how do you make the case to management of here's what we need to provide for facility managers. So keep a lookout for that, but these are really important questions that we need to think about as we address these different questions. One, another question that's come up is, you know, what is the average retirement age of a facility manager? When we looked at that, um, if you look to IPMA's uh, global compensation report, the average age of FM uh, at retirement has been uh, as around 68 or, or 70 years old. That's typically what we found for that. The full report uh, does provide details about what that entails here. Again really interesting. So the reason why this is such an interesting topic, I think to you all, is that the last thing I'll talk about this, we asked facility managers in IFMA's uh, global salary board, is how interested are you personally in succession planning? And what we found here is that 90% and more than 3,000 facility professionals said that this is valuable and this is of interest to us. So IFMA is working on a succession planning project. We've got the pilot report that will be published, uh, released here soon. And we're doing following work here to actually look at this about what key personality profiles and human dimensions and different things we need to look at in terms of how, <coughs> excuse me, how do we address these different things? So <clears throat> in summary here, when we think about the staffing question here again, there's a couple of things here. Is that the traditional approach to dealing with staffing issues is to promote mid-level employees to be in these senior positions. But in my opinion, an adjustment is needed. We fix the bubble of not having somebody in place here, but the loss of experiential knowledge is still a major problem. And that's why having a strategic perspective about how do we transition to the next workforce here is something really key we have to think about. The other thing here too, is that think about when somebody transitions very quickly without documenting what they do, the loss of efficiency, innovation, growth, ideas, all of these things are lost here if you don't think about how do we do this um, effectively. Keep in mind here that in, in succession planning specific to facility management, there's almost nothing out there about this topic. There's lots of anecdotes, but there's nothing that actually quantifies how do we do this effectively, what personality traits do we need to look for in, inside of this here. So what do we do about this? Um, a couple of thoughts about how do we uh, address this issue. The first thing is that education is paramount. 
people have to get educated, whether it's a certificate program, uh, graduate degrees. I mean, we have a graduate degree in facility management here at UC Charlotte. That's another great way. Uh, IFMA has various credential programs, the FMP, the SFP, and the CFM. Whatever it is here, that getting our education for facility professionals is really, really important. The second thing I, I would suggest here is that technology used effectively can also make a big difference. It can augment, I would say, in certain regards, our manpower, our, our, our people power to be able to do some of these different things. And you think about benchmarking as well, that's the ability to show that we paid for something and we actually got what we paid for. That's the power in benchmarking. And this report is one of the key ways that we can think about that. And finally, um, and this is kind of a, an oddball comment here, but sustainability and workforce are interconnected to each other. In the future, if we expect to have a more sustainable environment, it's, it's limited, our ability to do that is limited by the capability of the people we hire to do those things. So if we wanna have a more efficient, more sustainable facility environment, we have to hire people that know what they're doing, that have the skills and the expertise to be able to do these things, because otherwise the best we can do is the best we could do given the people that we have here. So we could talk about this a lot more here, but these are some key things to, to think about uh, with this. Uh, really uh, kind of last thing here is that uh, I will be at World Workplace this year. Um, we've got a number of presentations, myself and a colleague, uh, we're presenting on, we actually have a new report if it was published about the latest results from the IFMA credentials, the value of an IFMA credential. So we present the results of that at World Workplace. When you're talking about how to buy your next IT uh, solution for FM, we have another report that's being wrapped up right now. Uh, we have some other reports that we're going to summarize the results on. So we'll present on that. That's on uh, Friday morning. And then finally, Friday at about noon, uh, we're going to look at what other energy technologies our peers are using. I kind of alluded to that very early on. And so we have some other data and reports that will summarize it. So if you like research, you like cutting edge developments and facility management, uh, I would love to meet you all. Come out to the presentations and uh, hopefully it's a value to you and your peers. So take a screenshot of this and I would love to meet you all and uh, be great to see you. So in summary here for benchmarking, wrap everything up, key considerations, start small. If you've never done benchmarking, this is something new and different to you, just start with something that's really simple for you to do. Collect some simple metrics, look at an uh, annual report, whatever it is, do whatever you can today, that's the best way to get started. The second idea kind of tied to this is this idea of good, better, and best. Something good is to just track anything for benchmarking. Just track something that doesn't matter what it is, you know, just, just do something, that, that's good. Better is to track something that allows you to take action based on the data that you have. So if you collect a benchmark and you realize that there's a shortcoming and you do something about it, that's better. The best way to do this is to do these things on a regular basis on an annual, quarterly, monthly basis, whatever it is, but do that on a continuous basis because we can't show improvement, we can't show that we're changing if we actually haven't tracked these things on a regular basis. So good, better, best is a way to think about this. The third thing here is that when you do really effective benchmarking, you can develop better business cases and advocate for the funding and resources you need within your organization. We do uh, consult with and we support various groups that need help with this. So do you need some help and support in developing a better business case or evaluating the performance of your contractors? Uh, definitely reach out to me and we can provide some insights and guidance and really hands-on support if this is of, of, of interest to you. And finally, a uh, last comment here is that FM needs to become a, a data-driven function, right? We have a lot of data at our fingertips and I think in the future that as we look at where the facilities function is going over time, this is a key part of something that we'll need to think about and consider as we move forward here uh, into the future here. So if you uh, have questions, uh, be sure to email me, uh, jake.smithwick at uncc.edu. I'd be love to talk with you and provide some resources. Uh, but again here, um, be sure to uh, reach out if you do have any questions. And of course, meet us at World Workplace. Uh, we have a, a couple minutes for questions. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, now's the time to add those in and it would be take to answer anything else that we may uh, have a come across here. So one of the first questions we have is, does data-driven mean explicitly quant data? That, that's a really good question. So Melissa, what I think that means here 
is using quantitative data um, to a certain degree, right? We've all heard about big data. In fact, you can get data on all sorts of things here. So what I mean by quantitative data is that people, we operate on, on money, right? We think about money that it drives a lot of our business decisions. When you think about the types of benchmarks to collect here, I think having quantitative data that ties to our ability to like save money. I mean, if you can tell your boss that, hey, I, I, I was able to save us a lot of money last year. Okay, that's qualitative. You can also say we saved 10% last year, that's better. You can also say we saved more than $5 million. So most when I talk about quantitative data, I mean data that helps us make a story. Data that helps us convince our executives, that convinces our peers that here's the value that FM brings to the organization. I think the best way to do that is to have quantitative numbers that illustrate that. If it's too nuanced, if it's too specific or detailed, it's really hard for us to make that case. Excellent, excellent question, and uh, you know, thanks for that. Um, how do we get the report? Um, again, um, Paul, this will be published on the IFMA bookstore in about two weeks, so be sure to keep an eye on that. I'm sure we'll do um, other reach out outreaches once that's available, so be sure to look at that. Thanks, Ashley, for putting that onto the, on the screen here. Uh, how do you email me? Uh, Jake.smithwick, uncc.edu, and uh, that's the best way to get a hold of me. Thank you, Paul. Oh, uncc.edu, extra dot. Awesome. Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, folks, um, honestly and sincerely, thank you so much for being here today. This report is going to be coming out soon. We're very excited for it. If you do have questions, be sure to reach out to me. I hope to see a world workplace. I hear it's going to be a huge audience and uh, be, be glad to meet all of all you. And uh, take care of yourselves. Stay safe, stay healthy. And until next time, take care. Goodbye.